We have been warming up the filaments and have now thrown voltage on the plates. It's time to air this week in amateur radio. Now celebrating our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1228 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL Board of Directors holds their second meeting in Windsor, Connecticut. We will have team coverage. Amateur Radio makes the connection to save lives. We will have two stories for you from Wisconsin and Idaho. A radio amateur in New York City built and is dedicating a brand new repeater to honor the broadcast engineers lost on 9-11. We will have all the details. Germany proposes a new entry-level license called Class N. FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel proposes changes to tighten security on the nationwide emergency alert system. AMSAT outlines how you can track the Artemis 1 spacecraft when it lifts off using welcome beacons. The 5th Annual QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is coming up next weekend. Brazil announces that it now has the highest number of amateurs on the air in that country. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Chairman reports on the preparatory efforts leading up to next year's World Radio Conference and what bands of amateur radio frequencies need defense. And a cross-band activation of NEPM, the battleship USS Iowa, will be coming up using its original call sign. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will have his tech word of the week, which has to do with the latest processor internal wiring measurements. And the industry just announced that new USB version 4, which is version 2.0 of the new version 4, is coming soon to a device near you. Australia's own Otto Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will continue his look at the amateur's code, this week covering what he calls progressiveness in amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of his summer series entitled Amateur Radio History Headlines. This week, Bill takes a look at the major headlines from back in the middle 1980s. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, climbs his vertical office once again to bring us his best tips on how to work safely on tower sidearms. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio just outside Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the ham shack of K2MST at the Museum of Science and Technology in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our amateur radio station atop the Catskill Mountains in western New York, where after three inches of rain, the creeks and rivers are all flowing noisily, and yet we're in for four or five days of beautiful fall weather. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from a rapidly cooling Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where summer and autumn are settling in for their annual battle, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. The ARRL Board of Directors gathered for its second meeting of 2022 in Windsor, Connecticut. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is standing by at League Headquarters with a special report. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, opened the July meeting with a moment of silence for those radio amateurs who had passed away since the last meeting. Among those remembered was life member Bob Bruniga, WB4APR of Glen Burnie, Maryland, who died on February 7th. Bruniga created the Automatic Packet Reporting Radio System, known as APRS, of course, and he shared his broad knowledge and experience in amateur radio and electronics throughout his life. 
The meeting also included a report from ARRL Foundation President David Norris, K5UZ. Norris shared that the foundation awarded $922,250 for scholarships to 139 students this season. Norris made note of the generous funding from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, which substantially increased the scholarship awards, and additional funding from ARDC that granted $500,000 for the newly launched ARRL Foundation Club grant program. The foundation also awarded just over $41,000 to six organizations for the betterment and advancement of amateur radio. The board also approved the following actions during the meeting, including permitting the inclusion of military veteran status in ARRL's publication of Silent Key reports. The information will be gathered from Silent Key submissions. Recognition is permitted for all honorably discharged members of the U.S. Armed Forces and all National Guards. Directing the ARRL CEO secretary to vote in favor of International Amateur Radio Union's proposal number 263, which concerns the admission of the Sudan Amateur Radio Union, SARU, as an, IR, as an IARU member society. You can read the complete ARRL board member meeting report on the homepage at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Midwest Division Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ, who is chair of the Ethics and Elections Committee, summarized the committee's report, noting that it would take on the task of creating an all-inclusive election guidebook that would address all activities related to the conduct and procedures of elections. Later in the meeting, the board approved establishing an AWRL Election Review Committee under the aegis of the E&E Committee. Among the proposed purposes of the new committee is to develop an integrated one-stop document that defines election procedures, the behavior of those conducting the election, and all ethical and behavioral requirements imposed on candidates. The board also approved including a non-voting staff appointee to support the E&E committee. Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB, who is the board liaison to the Logbook of the World Committee, reported that Logbook of the World availability continues to be excellent at 99.99% in the last 90 days, exceeding the 99% goal. In his first report as treasurer, John Sager, WJ7S, highlighted that the ARRL investment portfolio declined by 9.2% in the second quarter and declined by 11.1% for the year to date. He noted that despite the recent sharp downturn, the portfolio's value remains greater than it was two years ago after considering withdrawals for operations. Sager also summarized the activities of the Permanent Investment Management Committee and expressed appreciation for the board's foresight in hiring an outside investment manager and creating the committee to oversee portfolio management. He expressed his confidence in the value that such a structure will have in inspiring confidence from ARRL members and future donors. Chief Financial Officer Diane Middleton, W2DLM, reported that even with the impact that downward financial markets have had on total assets, the association's balance sheet remains solid with healthy cash balances. In other board actions, the board approved the following actions during the meeting. Establishing a means for all members to access and or subscribe to all division and section emails. Currently, members may subscribe to emails for their respective division and section. The board made amendments to Bylaw 40, which includes the duties of the Emergency Communications and Field Services Committee. The board established the Emergency Communications and Field Services Committee as a standing committee in July 2021. The amendments to Bylaw 40 clarify the committee's role with respect to matters within the scope of its duties. With more on the latest ARRL board meeting, we go to our own Chris Perrine, KB2, FAF. Also present at the meeting were International Amateur Radio Union Secretary Joel Harrison, W5ZN, and President of the Radio Amateurs of Canada, Phil McBride, VA3QR. In his greeting, Harrison made note of the upcoming World Radio Communication Conference, WRC23. McBride highlighted Radio Amateurs of Canada efforts to advance positions involving frequency coordination for amateur satellites, and Agenda Item 1.2, which considers identification of the frequency bands 3.3 to 3.4 MHz, 3.6 to 3.8 MHz, 6.425 to 7.025 MHz, 8.5 to 9.5 MHz, and 10 to 10.5 MHz for International Mobile Telecommunications. 
In other activities, it is the board's practice to recognize individuals, groups, and organizations for their contributions to ARRL and the greater amateur radio community at each board meeting. The board recognized William Hudzik, W2UDT, for his 20 years of service to ARRL and its members. Hudzik retired in February as vice director of the Hudson Division. First licensed in 1961, Hudzik honorably served in multiple elected ARRL positions, including Northern New Jersey Section Manager from 2001 to 2008 and Hudson Division Vice Director from 2011 to 2022. He also served as a member of several board committees, including the Historical Committee, on which he still serves today as a volunteer. The board congratulated and extended its appreciation to the members of the RF Safety Committee for their contributions to the science and practice of amateur radio and, more generally, of radio communications. Earlier this year, members of the RF Safety Committee were recognized and honored by the Radio Society of Great Britain with the 2021 Founders Trophy for their work and collaboration with the RSGB on methods of conforming with RF exposure regulations. The board also recognized the following ARRL affiliated clubs for their lengthy tenure and service to the amateur radio community. Uniontown Amateur Radio Club and the ARRL Western Pennsylvania Section and ARRL Special Service Club, affiliated since May 1930 and incorporated on February 20th, 1933. Masabi Wireless Association of Minnesota and ARRL affiliated club since October 2nd, 1947. Cambridge Amateur Radio Association of Ohio, an ARRL affiliated club since February 20th, 1947 and founded in 1913. West Seattle Amateur Radio Club of Washington, an ARRL special service club affiliated since October 2nd, 1947. The Palo Alto Amateur Radio Association of California, an ARRL affiliated club established in 1937. Rochester Amateur Radio Club of Minnesota, an ARRL affiliated club since July 30th, 1971, founded in 1932. Motor City Radio Club of Michigan, an ARRL special service club founded in 1932. Red River Amateur Radio of North Dakota, an ARRL affiliated club since September 27th, 1969, and the St. Paul Radio Club of Minnesota, an ARRL affiliated club since November 2nd, 1931 and founded in 1931. The meeting adjourned on Saturday morning. The complete minutes are available at www.arrl.org slash board dash meetings. The World Radio Conference is looming on the horizon. Although it's not until 2023, the date will come round soon enough, and with all the major players with their sights on the radio spectrum attending, you may be assured that amateur radio will be under as great a threat as ever. The big organisations will be hoping to use financial might and swathes of classy-looking professional research to add weight to their arguments for more spectrum, or expanding their use, or protecting their existing interests by trying to vouchsafe exclusive use in sections of the radio waves in order to minimise interference to their services. So the radio amateur fraternity needs to have a polished response to attacks on its interests, which is why many meetings are currently taking place to ensure that the whole global amateur radio movement is speaking with one clear and informed voice. Writing on the IARU website, the chair of the IARU Region 1 Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee, Barry Lewis, Golf 4 Sierra Juliet Hotel, has been reporting on the WRC 23 preparatory activities. As WRC 23 gets closer, so the preparatory activities for all the agenda items are increasing in intensity. The most pressing for the amateur community is the 23 centimetre band radio navigation satellite service coexistence. The IARU engagement is continuing with the studies in the regulatory institutions as well as amongst the amateur radio community. As detailed proposals are starting to emerge, so the amateur community needs to be ready to defend its interests in this band. 
Following the presentations given during the IARU Region 1 Interim Conference and the Ham Radio 2022 event, the IARU was kindly invited to present the 23 centimetre band situation to the Earth Moon Earth community at the 19th EME Conference in Prague. Reactions were mixed. However, the IARU maintained its objective to find a solution that can facilitate all the amateur radio applications active in the band today, including Earth Moon Earth operators, even if some compromises will be inevitable. To progress the 23 centimetre band studies, an International Telecommunications Union Working Party will meet during the second week of September. At this meeting, the technical studies regarding the amateur service and radio navigation satellite service will be developed further. The IARU global team is preparing contributions and will be participating in the meeting. During the same week, the European CEPT will be busy with its own conference preparatory group project team, focusing on the future WRC agenda items. Already, some draft proposals are touching on spectrum bands of interest to the amateur service. Therefore, IARU volunteers will be attending this meeting and making contributions. You can find out more by visiting the IARU Region 1 website at iaru-r1.org. The following two rescue stories are great examples of why amateur radio is important. The first story occurred in Wisconsin and is told by ARRML member Scott Strecker, KG9IV, in his own words. Strecker shares how he was able to help a ham in distress. Thanks to the Chippewa Valley Amateur Radio Club in Wisconsin, an ARRL affiliated club for this information. It was Friday, September 2nd, 2022, which meant I worked from my home office. I have VHF radios on low to monitor them in the background. Recently, I got to the All-Star node on Hotspot, and I used it to monitor the FM38 system, All-Star 2495, in the southern part of Wisconsin. At about 9.45 a.m., I heard the All-Star node come up. An individual in distress was asking for assistance to get an ambulance. It was a ham in Brown Deer, Wisconsin. He had slipped on his bathroom floor and went down so hard he couldn't get up, but he happened to have his hand held with him, and didn't, don't we all, and he didn't have access to the phone, and he lived alone. I called the Brown Deer Police Call Center. The dispatcher got the fire department rolling and started asking me for more details. I had the dispatcher on speakerphone. He could hear the ham's responses to the question. Being on handheld and lying prone, the signal was at times noisy, and at times both the other ham and I used ITU phonetics to get the exact information out. All those times practicing on the Aries nets made it second nature. The dispatcher was also able to understand the info without me having to repeat it. It felt good to help out, and I also realized it was due to my monitoring that I was able to hear his call. If you're not participating in weekly local Aries nets, I would encourage you to do so when you can. And now with the details on the second amateur radio rescue story, we go to league headquarters, where John Ross, KD8IDI, tells that story. The second rescue story involved newly licensed amateur radio operators Shannon Vohr, KK7GVG, and C.J. Bruchard, KK7GNG. On Saturday, September 3rd, in the Rocky Mountains in northwest Idaho, they were out for a weekend of four-wheeling in their Jeep. This is an area that's extremely mountainous with no towns, very few people, no facilities, and, of course, no cell phone coverage. About 4.30 p.m., they were taking a break when an approaching truck notified them of an ATV accident involving two teenage girls. The accident scene was just a few miles away, and when they arrived, it was clear the teenagers were critically injured. Bouchard was unable to contact several local repeaters, but was finally able to make contact using a simplex frequency, 146.420 MHz, that's popular with the hams of Cordialine, 20 miles just from the accident site. While Bouchard and an off-duty EMT were administrating medical aid to the teenagers or took over radio operations, the call for emergency assistance was picked up by local amateur radio operator John Tapero, K7JNT, who immediately called 911 and asked that the 146.420 MHz channel be used only for emergency traffic. For nearly two hours, Vor and Temporero provided relay communications to the 911 dispatcher, advising of the condition of the injured and approaching weather. Life Flight Network was unable to respond because of a severe thunderstorm immediately over the rescue site. 
Two teams of EMTs were dispatched, but due to the mountains and the storm, they couldn't communicate with their dispatch center. Taparero continued to provide relay information for all parties until 6 p.m. when the EMTs arrived. The teenagers were in stable condition and immediately transported to the nearest hospital. Today, they're in good condition and recovering. It took us about two days to wind down from the experience, said Vore. We are both glad we had our amateur radio licenses and were able to help. Bashar said that they had been using radios on the general mobile radio system. The area's signals, though, were not good and it was difficult to communicate. So they studied, took their exams, and are now looking forward to much more amateur radio opportunities, joining a local radio club and becoming involved in Aries. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. In addition to Strecker's story, newly licensed amateur radio operators Shannon Vohr, KK7GVG, and CJ Bouchard, KK7GNG, also shared a rescue story. Both Vohr and Bouchard are now looking to join a local amateur radio club and become involved in the ARRL, Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Six broadcast engineers killed in the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center will be remembered during a special ham radio dedication and memorial this weekend. Andrew Denoncourt, an amateur radio enthusiast, N1MYY, who works in the tech support at Comrex, expects to sign on the new ham radio repeater at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 11th to honor the six broadcast engineers, Bob Pattison, Don DeFranco, Steve Jacobson, Bill Steckman, Rob Coppola, and Isaias Rivera. I plan to read a brief statement and cite the names of the six fallen broadcast engineers, and I want to dedicate the installation to them, Denoncourt said. It just worked out because of the timing of it all. The new site being dedicated as a memorial to the six broadcast engineers will be on 146.460 MHz and will be part of the New England Emergency Communications Network, which is a digital network of approximately 90 amateur radio service repeaters. The new repeater has its antenna mounted 300 feet up on the tower of WXRV-FM in Haverhill, Massachusetts, Denoncourt told Radio World magazine. For me, at least, it's something that we all should remember. This amateur radio community shares a lot in common with the six broadcast engineers we lost. I've just always remembered them, Denoncourt said. And it's not just the six broadcast engineers we need to remember, but all of those who were taken away. Amateur radio resources were mobilized in New York City and neighboring New Jersey on 9-11 after commercial telecommunications wired and wireless systems were severely compromised, according to various media reports. For further information, Denoncourt can be reached at yankeeradio at hotmail.com. Labre, the National Amateur Radio Society of Brazil, have published a new statistical study on amateur radio in the country, updated with data from 2022 and prepared by Ricardo, Papa Yankee 2, Quebec Bravo. Since 2020, Labre have published this study that helps to shed light on the reality with regard to amateur radio in Brazil. Like previous issues, this study is based on the official data made available by the Brazilian regulator Anatel on the Brazilian Open Data Portal and on its own sites. To fuel the study, these various databases were collected, filtered, crossed and structured by Ricardo, who has experience in this area. Among the conclusions, the most obvious is that the number of radio amateurs has increased in Brazil since last year. Almost a thousand new hams today are on the air, a growth of 2.2%, and meaning that there is now over 40,000 radio amateurs in Brazil as of July 2022. The state with the highest number of radio amateurs remains Sao Paulo, with more than 10,000. The state with the highest density of radio amateurs also remains the same, Paraíba, which has more than 45 radio amateurs per 100,000 inhabitants. In relation to cities, Sao Paulo leads with 2,430 radio amateurs, followed by Rio de Janeiro with 1,521 and Fortaleza 1,447. In Brazil, there are three licensed classes, starting with C, Charlie, and working up to level A, Alpha. 
The study showed that the Class C licence is the most prevalent in relation to the total number of radio amateurs, but with a slight decrease to 70%. In 2021 it was 71%, which shows that many amateurs make the licence class promotion, although in Labre's view the distribution is far from ideal. Another interesting piece of data from the study shows that there's still a profound inequality in licensed radio amateurs in terms of sex. Only 6% are women, compared to 94% of male operators. In 2021, the percentage was 7%. Speaking of stations, the 2022 study shows that more than 63,000 mobile, fixed, repeater, beacon and terrestrial stations exist. Of these, more than 17,000 are in the state of Sao Paulo alone. To see all the details and download the study in full, go to www.labre.org.br and you can find a lot more about amateur radio in Brazil by visiting tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Brazil. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Our 17th year of tech guying. So I just noted that TikTok had 3 billion downloads. How many people are in the US? 350 million? How many people in the world? 7 billion? 3 billion downloads. Now, I mean, that's not 3 billion unique users because I know I've downloaded a few times myself personally. You know, I do that with TikTok. I download it. I install it. I play with it. I wake up, I, you know, suddenly realize I've been TikToking for the last four and a half hours. The guy comes on and says, hey, you really, you need to go to bed. They, they, they literally, if, you, if you're on it long enough, TikTok puts up a, a video that says, get a drink of water, take a walk. You know, you, you've been really on this for a long time. <laughs> when I see that guy, I go, oh, I better go to sleep. I got to work in the morning. When that happens a couple of times, I delete TikTok in a rage. No more TikTok for me. And then I reinstall it a month later. And then I, it's a rinse, lather, repeat kind of a thing. It's a love-hate relationship. So that's why 3 billion downloads. I bet you half those people have downloaded it just like me and deleted it and downloaded it and deleted it. Last week I had a word of the week. I thought I'm not going to do this every week. Don't worry. It's not, a, it's not a regular feature. But there is a word of the week this week, I thought, that is kind of new. It's angstrom. Yeah, angstrom. A-N-G-S-T-R-O-M, Swedish word. So the A has a little halo over it, and the O has an umlaut. So it's probably pronounced Angström. It's named after a guy, I'm sure. It is one hundred millionth of a centimeter, ten billionth of a meter. Why would we care about it? You know, you, you, it's such a tiny little thing. You measure the wavelength of light in angstroms. It's several hundred angstroms. What would we care about angstroms for? Because it's the new measure of processors you're going to hear about. I don't know if you've been following this at all. When we talk about the CPU, the microprocessor, actually GPU too, any of the processors in your computers or phones or tablets or, you know, uh, any, you know, microwave, they often talk about the size of the wires in that thing, which is really better represented by the number of transistors or the transistor density or something like that. But for some reason, we measure the size of the wires. And they've gotten smaller and smaller. Intel's microprocessors are 10 nanometers, 10 billionths of a meter. Is that right? Nano, billion. Uh, yeah, I have to remind myself of the international system of units every time. You've got a meter, which is about a yard, right? A centimeter, which is a hundredth of a meter. You know, in the other direction, kilometer is a thousand meters, right? So centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Millimeter is a hundredth of a centimeter or a thousandth of a meter. And it goes down from there. A nanometer is pretty small. It's so, it's smaller, thinner than a hair. Yeah. No, it's super, it's super small. So let's see, you got centi milli micrometer okay that's a millionth of a meter nanometer which is a billionth or millardeth of a meter pico is the next one but we're not going to use picometer we're not going to use picometer in measuring these chips so intel's 10 nanometers some 14 
ARM and some other processors are now getting smaller. TSMC is making uh, processors that are the equivalent of four nanometers. In fact, they just they're starting to build a plant for two nanometers. Well, pretty soon you got you got to go to a new measurement because you got one one nanometer. What it, then? What's next? So what's next? Well, it should be picometer, but we're going to instead we're going to go to angstrom. That's the word of the week, angstrom. So you're going to start seeing uh, processors using a 20A, and it'll be an A with a little halo over it, 20, like the Anaheim Angels, little A, oh, and a little halo over it. That is an angstrom, one ten billionth of a meter. There you go. That's the number, one ten billionth of a meter. So 20 angstroms is actually two nanometers. And, but that way we can get down to 10 angstroms, 5 angstroms, 2 angstroms. I don't know what we're going to do after that. They get so small, pretty soon you're, I mean, you're well below, you're subatomic now. Angstroms measure the distance between atoms and material and things. I mean, it's tiny. Why is this important? Well, really, the, the really important measurement, which nobody uses, is density of transistors on these chips. The more transistors you can get on these chips, the more powerful they are. In fact, that's the very famous Moore's Law that was coined, you know, back in the, I don't know, 60s. Moore, Gordon Moore was a um, engineer at uh, one of the early microprocessor companies and then later went to uh, Intel. He created up Moore's Law. He was the chairman and founder of uh, Intel. And Moore's Law, for a long time, drove computers. It was actually the most important, probably the most important thing in technology, even though no one's ever heard of it. Well, geeks have. Moore's law held that the number of transistors on a processor would double every year and a half, every 18 months. And it held true for a long time. Now, if you double and double that and then double that and double that, that's big, right? That's a big growth. And in fact, the latest uh, M1 processor from Apple, which is pretty small, <laughs> it's about the size of, a, I don't know, your fingernail, your pinky fingernail, it has 16 billion with the B transistors on it, that's roughly a measurement of its power. You know, the uh, uh, the Intel, let's see, the first PC was built on an Intel 8088 microprocessor. And its its transistor count, its transistor count was uh, 29,000, 29,000. And so that's the point is that this number has doubled every year and a half for the last 30 or 40 years. We're actually kind of at the end of Moore's Law. You can't keep doing that. But it's pretty impressive. You got 16 billion. So we went from the earliest days of computing. The Macintosh, first Macintosh, had a processor with 68,000 transistors. So the first Mac had 68,000 transistors in its processor. The current Mac has, what did I say? I forgot already. These numbers, 16 billion. That's a that's a big shift, isn't it? That's a lot. And, and that roughly equates to the power of the processor. So I just, the word of the week is angstrom because we're going to start hearing these 20A, they're talking about 20A processors. That's the equivalent of two nanometers. I'm letting you know ahead of time, a word of warning. You can add that to your geek dictionary. Actually, we, you know, Intel kind of ran out of steam on this. And that's why they started because the processors were getting so hot. You know, usually when you get it smaller, it's cooler, but Intel just had trouble making those. So instead of uh, making them smaller, they just put more transistors in it, more uh, processors in a chip. So that's why we talk about, you know, four core and eight core and dual core processors. Because instead of just making them smaller and faster, they just put more of them on there, which is not quite the same. Not quite the same. I'm sorry I even, I'm sorry I even started. It's just, I, I find this, to me, Maybe that's why I'm in this business. I find that fascinating that you go from a chip with, you know, the first Mac with 68,000 processors to the current Mac or transistors in the processor, 68,000 transistors in the processor to the current Mac with a lot more. 60, what did I say? I keep forgetting. Huge. It's just, it's mind boggling. 16 billion transistors in the, just mind boggling. 16 billion transistors in the chip your phone in your pocket if you have a late model iphone say you have an a14 in there the bionic 11.8 billion i mean you we're talking a lot of we're that's powerful stuff powerful uh let's see what else can we talk about speaking of technology some new technologies coming to a, a computer near you usb 
version 4 2.0. <laughs> okay. I'm not kidding. So it's USB 4, but it's version 2.0 of USB 4. Whatever. The good news is it'll be twice as fast as USB 4 version 1. It's twice as fast. It's, it goes to 2. Amazing. 80 gigabits per second, which no one could ever use because that's about, that's roughly uh, 8 gigabytes of data per second. No hard drive can deliver that up. The value of this will be you could have a USB 4 version 2.0 dock and you could have 20 things attached to it and they'd all be fast. I guess that's the point. They say it will use the existing cables built into a USB 4 Type-C version 1.0, but there will be newly defined 80 gigabit per second USB Type-C version 2.0 active cables. Active is an important word. Which will undoubtedly cost as much as the Apple Watch, the gold Apple Watch. Get yourself ready. The future is coming. When? I don't know. You know, they announced these things, so it's official. And then developers and, and hardware manufacturers go, okay, now what? How much is that going to cost? And they start designing probably next year, right? Uh, we hope. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment to explain why real hams can't drive down Weaver Street. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1983. A ham in space. Owen Garriott, W5LFL, becomes the first amateur to operate on board a space shuttle. He makes hundreds of QSOs on two meters. Another code-free license idea pops up. Amateurs are overwhelmingly opposed and the proposal is dropped. 1984. The ten-year license replaces the five-year one. The FCC stopped giving examinations, turning the duty over to the new volunteer examiner program. The HF phone bands are expanded, and the amateur population is up to 410,000. 1985. State and local rules which restrict amateurs' antennas must now comply with the FCC's new policy expressed in PRB 1. The FCC gives itself preeminence in antenna regulations and states that local ordinances must provide for reasonable accommodations regarding amateurs' antennas. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. In Germany, the DARC reports on the planned introduction of a new entry-level amateur radio license. It will be limited in output power in the 144 and 430 MHz bands, but they can build their own equipment. A translation of the DARC post reads, the Federal Ministry for Digital Affairs and Transport presented the draft of a new amateur radio regulation that will bring some innovations for all radio amateurs. The chairman of the DARC and the Roundtable Amateur Radio, Christian Ensfeldner, DL3MBG, was pleased. The new regulation implements long-standing requirements of the DARC and the Roundtable Amateur Radio. Remote operation will finally be allowed in the future. The Ministry has also implemented our demand for a beginner class, which has existed since 2008. This makes it much easier to get started with amateur radio. While the existing classes E and A are raised in level due to the introduction of new topics from digital technology, Class N focuses on operational knowledge, regulations, and basic knowledge of the technology. Holders of the new Class N will be allowed to transmit on 2 meters and 70 centimeters with maximum power of 10 watts EIRP. The new entry-level class should offer access to amateur radio, in particular to young people and older people, in accordance with international requirements, explains board member Ronnie Yerke, DJ2RON. The legally stipulated self-build right is not restricted, so even beginners can develop, set up, and put into operation radio devices, or hotspots themselves. The exam will follow a cumulative system equal to the U.S. amateur radio test. 
First of all, the exam for class N is taken, which already contains all questions from the areas of operational knowledge and regulations. The technical test for class E and then for class A can then be taken. The examination catalogs developed by the DARC for the three classes are structured in such a way that the content and questions are not repeated. Content that has already been examined in a lower class no longer plays a role in the examination for a higher class. So all future radio amateurs go through the exams of class N through E to class A. It should be possible to take all the exams in one day. The previously unregulated remote operation has been included in the new amateur radio regulation. Holders of license class A may in future operate amateur radio stations remotely and also allow other radio amateurs to use class A. Another important innovation concerns the training radio operation which will be possible in the future without a separate training call sign. Instead, adding the prefix DN forward slash makes any class E or class A call sign a training call sign. The RTA now has four weeks to comment on the draft regulation. The board and the departments of the DARC have already started to examine the text of the ordinance in detail and will report promptly. When NASA's Artemis One rocket launches for its mission to the moon this month, you'll be able to track it using 70-centimeter beacons known as Outstanding Moon Exploration Technologies demonstrated by Nano Semi-Hard Impactors, or Omotenashis. Omotenashi is Japanese for welcome or hospitality, and it describes the 70-centimeter beacons as small spacecraft and semi-hard landers of the 6U CubeSat format, which will demonstrate low-cost technology to land and explore the lunar surface. Omotenashi will be one of 10 CubeSats to be carried with the Artemis 1 mission. Brian Wilkins, KO4AQF, says that with the Artemis real-time orbit website, anyone with internet access can pinpoint where Orion is and track its distance from the Earth, its distance from the Moon, the mission duration, and more. The Artemis real-time orbit website is available on NASA's website and Twitter account. The Artemis Real-Time Orbit website visualizes data collected by sensors on Orion that are sent to the Johnson Space Center's Mission Control Center in Houston during its flight. It will provide periodic real-time data beginning about one minute after liftoff through the separation of the Space Launch System rocket's interim cryogenic propulsion stage, approximately two hours into the flight. Once Orion is flying on its own, the Artemis Real-Time Orbit website will provide constant real-time information. On the web, users can follow the Artemis Real-Time Orbit website to see where Orion is in relation to the Earth and the Moon and follow Orion's path during the mission. Users can view key mission milestones and characteristics on the Moon, including information about landing sites from the Apollo program. Also available for download will be an ephemeris, which provides trajectory data from the flight. The Artemis Real-Time Orbit website will also provide a set of Orion's state vectors, data that describes precisely where Orion is in space and how it moves, for inclusion in these tweets once Orion is flying on its own. These vectors can be used for data lovers, artists, and creatives to make their own tracking app, data visualization, or anything else they envision. AMSAT member Joe Fitzgerald, KM1P, adds a second online tool called Horizons. The JPL Horizons Online Solar System Data and Computation Service provides access to key solar system data and flexible production of highly accurate locations for solar system objects such as asteroids, planetary satellites, planets, the Sun, and select spacecraft. Horizons is provided by the Solar System Dynamics Group of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Radio and TV stations could soon have additional EAS requirements to meet in the interest of cybersecurity. According to FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel, who is circulating a set of proposals among the commissioners that would bolster the security of the nation's public alert and warning systems, including the emergency alert system and wireless emergency alerts. One idea she is floating is to require stations and other EAS participants to report compromises of their EAS equipment. Another would require EAS participants and wireless providers that participate in wireless emergency alerts to certify every year that they have a cybersecurity risk management plan in place and to employ sufficient security measures to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of their respective alerting systems. She also wants to consider ways to improve 
the operational readiness of EAS, including looking at the amount of time that broadcasters, cable providers, and other EAS participants may operate before repairing a defective EAS equipment. And she would require wireless providers to take steps to ensure that only valid alerts are displayed on consumer devices. At this time, these are only points in a draft notice of proposed rulemaking, details of which are pending. If the commissioners vote yes, it means the FCC will take comments on the proposals before taking any further action. Rosenworcel said in her announcement, it is critical that these public safety systems are secure against cyber threats, which means that we must be proactive. The draft proposal shared today will help ensure that our national alerting system works as intended during emergencies and the public can trust the warnings they receive. Here is this week's AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5DO. We have learned from the FO99 command team and JAMSAT that the satellite should be operational for the next month as it remains in full sunlight. The DigiTalker, though, will be turned off during this time. And time is drawing near for the AMSAT Annual Space Symposium in Bloomington, Minnesota. It will take place October 21st and 22nd at the Crown Plaza at the Minnesota Airport. It's near the Mall of America, Nickelodeon Uverse Amusement Park, and the Minnesota Zoo. All great attractions for you and your family, and please consider joining them for the annual event. More information can be found at AMSAT.org along with a discounted room code. And if you need CN-74 on satellite, Frank KJ-7DZ will be roving from September 22nd through the 24th. Adrian N-8AJM will be working FM satellites with no set schedule in EM-85 from September 12th through the 16th. He may also activate a few grids on his trip from EN-72 as he travels to EM-85. And there is an informative AMSAT story in this week's ARRL letter outlining tracking for the Artemis One moon, wish, uh, moon mission using welcome beacons. All of the details on that story at the ARRL.org slash letter website. In a report from Reuters News Service, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission said Thursday it will vote this month on new rules to address the growing risk of orbital debris to space ambitions. Currently, the agency recommends operators of satellites in low Earth orbit ensure spacecraft will re-enter Earth's atmosphere within 25 years following the completion of missions. The new FCC rules would update the 2004 regulations and shrink the time frame required for satellite post-mission disposal to as soon as practicable, but no more than five years. The new rules would apply to both U.S. licensed satellites and systems and non-U.S. satellites seeking U.S. market access. The FCC noted that defunct satellites, discarded rocket cores, and other debris now fill the space environment, creating challenges for future missions, and in 2021, there were more than 4,800 satellites currently operating in orbit. The FCC 25-year recommendation is not required under the 2004 rules, but the agency had consistently applied the 25-year benchmark in licensing decisions. The Commission warned that as the number of objects in space increases, so too does the probability of collisions, and went on to say, at risk is more than $280 billion a year satellites and launch industries, and the jobs that depend on them, but also satellite connectivity, which is critical to modern life, including broadband in remote areas, navigation, and video. When disaster strikes, satellites help organize first responders, the government, and humanitarian organizations and make it possible to coordinate effective relief efforts, the FCC said. Left unchecked, orbital debris could block all of these benefits and reduce opportunities across nearly every sector of the economy. Last month, FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said the agency believes the new space age needs new rules and to make sure our rules are prepared for the proliferation of satellites in orbit and new activities in the higher altitudes. It's time for the Weekly Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week as usual by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that this reporting week, September 1st through the 7th, two new sunspot groups emerged on September 1st, two more on September 2nd, one more on September 5th, another on September 6th, another on September 7th, and one more on September 8th, when the sunspot number rose to 75 seven points above the average for the previous seven days.
But average daily sunspot numbers declined from 74.9 to 68, while average daily solar flux rose just two points from 123.8 to 125.8. On Thursday night, the sun is peppered with spots, but none are magically complex, and solar flux seems listless at 126.6, barely above the average for the previous seven days. Geomagnetic indicators were way up, however. The average daily planetary A index rose from 10.1 to 24.6, while the middle latitude numbers increased from 9.4 to 17.4. September 4th was the most active day when the planetary A index rose to 64. On that day, the College A index in Fairbanks, Alaska was 91. So taking a quick look ahead, the predicted solar flux will be 125 on September 10th through the 14th. 126 on September 15th, 125 on September 16th through the 17th, 126 and 120 on September 18th and 19th, and 125 on September 20th and 21st. Taking a look at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 50 on October 1st, otherwise the predicted planetary A index will be 8 on September 10th and 11th, 5 on September 12th, 20 on September 13th and 14th, 10 on September 15th, 8 on September 16th and 17th, and 5 on September 18th, all the way through the 22nd. Just ahead in radio sport contesting this week on September 10th, the VHF FOC QSO party, that's CW. September 10th through the 11th, the WAEDX contest, single sideband and phone there. Also September 10th through the 11th, the SKCC weekend sprintathon, that is CW. September 10th, the Ohio State Parks on the air, that is phone. September 10th through 11, the Alabama QSO party, CW and phone. September 10th through the 11th, the Russian Cup digital contest, that's all digital. And on September 12th or 10th through the 12th, the ARRL September VHF contest, that's CW phone and digital. September 11th, the North American Sprint, CW. And on September 12th, the Four States QRP Group Secondary Sunday Sprint, that is CW and phone. And here are some upcoming section, state, and division conventions to be aware of. On September 9th through the 10th, the Queen Wilhelmina Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Arkansas State Convention. That's in Mena, Arkansas. September 11th, the ARRL Southern New Jersey Section Convention. That's in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. September 17th through the 18th, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. That's an online event, and ARRL is a QSO Today partner. September 23rd through the 24th at the HRO Superfest, hosting the ARRL Central Division Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The 5th QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is adjourning next weekend, September 17th and 18th, 2022. The fully interactive and full-featured Virtual Ham Radio Convention will provide great interactive presentations, new content, and excellent networking opportunities, including 50-plus amateur radio presentations, on a wide variety of subjects. Check out the full list of presentations and get the downloadable schedule. For your first time, anyone can share their latest ham radio project, technology, operating mode, de-expedition, or history in the new project gallery. Submit your presentation, article, video, or slideshow at Project Gallery Submission. Meet with ARRL representatives and other exhibitors in the state-of-the-art video lounges. Visit the ARRL booth to meet over live video with ARRL staff and get your specific questions answered. Other exhibitors will answer product questions, provide technical training, etc. Tickets are only $10 and grant full access to the Expo Weekend, presentations, project gallery, and exhibitor video lounges as well as the 30-day post-Expo on-demand period, where all presentations and resources are available. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to www. QSO Today Ham Expo.com. ARRL is a QSO Today Expo partner. According to the Wireless Institute of Australia, two new youth related plaques have been added to the phone section of this year's Oceana DX contest on October 1st from 0600 UTC, sponsored by Oscar Ray's VK3TX, a noted DXer and an International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 director. The two new phone plaques are intended to engage younger hams. The World Youth Phone Plaque will recognize the highest scoring amateur of 25 years or younger from outside of Oceana. The Australia Youth Phone Plaque will recognize the highest scoring amateur 25 years of age or younger from within Australia. This is the 77th running of the contest whose aim is to get non-Oceana stations to contact those around the Pacific region. 
And the bands promised to be busy with VK and ZL operators calling CQ Oceana DX Contest. No matter what the job at hand is, if you're going to tackle it, you're going to need the right set of tools. And if your job includes making sense out of any of the signals in the virtual soup of RF energy we live in, then the Hackaday website says that you're going to need something like the Fisher RF framework. That's F-I-S-S-U-R-E. Fisher stands for Frequency Independent SDR-Based Signal Understanding and Reverse Engineering. While this is all pretty new, the system was recently presented at a Defence Ready Condition event a few weeks back, showing how Fisher can be used to analyse power line communications between trucks and their trailers, and they've got a talk scheduled for next month's GNU radio conference as well. GNU is a software development tool for the signal process processing environment, particularly for radio frequency hardware projects. Fisher appears to be an RF hacker's dream come true. They've got a few examples on Twitter, like brute forcing an old garage door opener with a security code set by a 10 position dip switch, and sending tire pressure monitoring system signals to a car. It looks like Fisher could be a lot of fun and very handy for your RF analysis and reverse engineering work. If you've been using Universal Radio Hacker, this looks similar, only more so. Hackaday promises a hands-on report in the near future. Foundations of Amateur Radio The third clause of the original Amateur's Code reads, The Amateur is progressive. He keeps his station abreast of science. It is billed well and efficiently. His operating practice is clean and regular. The 2022 ARRL handbook is similar. The radio amateur is progressive, with knowledge abreast of science, a well-built and efficient station, and operation above reproach. The ARRL website adds in some pronouns and removes the science from the clause. The radio amateur is progressive. He, she keeps his, her station up to date. It is well-built and efficient. His, her operating practice is above reproach. I'm not sure what prompted this alteration, and frankly, I'm not a fan. Pronouns aside, science is at the heart of what it is that we do, and that has been the case since the very first amateur went on air. It's also bewildering to me that knowledge and science has been transformed into keeping your station up to date, which means something else entirely. The original is about learning and education. In my opinion, the ARRL website version is about shopping, and frankly it's distasteful in a world where we as amateurs are renowned for experimentation and constructing a solution from parts. It raises another question. Who actually made this change, and what process exists to actually implement it? Is it the whim of an individual, or is there a committee that was elected to investigate and update the code? If it was an elected body, how does it represent me in Australia? And how does it represent any amateur beyond the shores of the United States, or even beyond the membership of the ARRL? Consider the scope of amateur radio as a global activity. The Amateur's Code has spread far and wide in the past century, well beyond its apparent origins as a page in the third edition of the ARRL Handbook in 1927. In my opinion, this code is not an ARRL-owned document. It belongs to all amateurs across Earth, and it should be treated as such. As I've said before, it's a living document, and it has evolved over time. But that doesn't mean it can be changed on a whim. There should be rigorous discussion in a public forum that informs any such change, and at present I see no evidence of that at all. To illustrate its reach further, the IAIU has a document called Ethics and Operating Procedures for the Radio Amateur, with edition 3 published in 2010. It contains a copy of the code with yet another version of clause 3. The radio amateur is progressive. He keeps his station up to date. It is well built and efficient. His operating practice is above reproach. Clearly change is being implemented somewhere, and it might well be that this version informed the current version on the ARRL website 12 years later. I'll also note that there is a copyright statement in that IARU document that contains a whole lot of, in my opinion, unenforceable verbiage, including the requirement that any copy or portion is required to include a copyright notice, which in the case of the included amateur's code is murky at best. 
I also note that it credits Paul Segal in 1928, something which we've already established is wrong, given that the code appears in print in 1927 and has been credited to him as far back as 1923. Back to the clause. I think that keeping science as an integral part of the conversation is essential. I'm going to repeat the original clause as published for reference. The amateur is progressive. He keeps his station abreast of science. It is built well and efficiently. His operating practice is clean and regular. In addition to science, there's a statement about how to build and how to operate. It's a little curious to use the word progressive, but it means to happen or develop gradually or in stages. In other words, you don't need to be perfect on day one, but you do need to strive for the objectives as part of an evolutionary process. So, progressive, science, well-built and well-operated. That seems like a recipe for lifelong learning, in my opinion, a lofty goal to strive for. What if we lost the last century pronouns, removed the shopping imperative and kept the tone? The radio amateur is progressive, keeping abreast of science, striving to build and operate their station above reproach. Would such a clause inspire you to do better, to build and grow as an amateur, to improve and learn? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. SpaceX has filed a petition lobbying for eligible telecommunication carrier, or ETC, status with the Federal Communications Commission, according to reports via ARS Technica. The filing also details SpaceX plans for Starlink in the future. While Starlink is currently beta testing its satellite internet service, SpaceX wants to add voice over IP to the service's repertoire at some point. Starlink will also offer emergency 24-hour battery backup to go along with VOIP so that users don't lose access to the service in the event of a power outage. SpaceX's primary goal with the Starlink service is to bring affordable, high-speed internet to individuals and areas currently devoid of it, which the company is already making decent progress on. To aid in its efforts, Starlink is requesting ETC status from the FCC, which would make the provider eligible for participation in the U.S. government's Lifeline program. With subsidies from the Lifeline program, Starlink will be able to provide cheaper phone and internet plans to qualifying low-income individuals. According to the FCC filing, Starlink also plans on providing both internet and phone services to its consumers as a common carrier, which would put Starlink under the governance of Title II of the Communications Act. Starlink is currently providing satellite internet service in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. as an opt-in beta with stellar reviews across the board. SpaceX recently revealed that Starlink has over 10,000 users in total. Demand for the service has been so overwhelming that SpaceX is lobbying the FCC for a 400% increase in allowed user terminal deployments to 5 million in total. First satellite internet and now the idea of a phone service from Starlink? Canadians in rural areas are really happy about this proposal. American broadcaster WCJB reports that North Central Florida residents have taken amateur radio training in case of a major disaster. The Alachua County Amateur Radio Emergency Service and the North Florida Amateur Radio Club held a training class to help residents get their radio technician license from the FCC, their spectrum regulator. Dr. Gordon Gibby, Kilo X-Ray 4 Zulu, taught some of the training and said that it's important to learn how to use ham radio in case the power grid goes out. He recalled the major hurricanes Katrina, Sandy and Michael and asked people to consider their role in how best to help a neighbour. He said that a lot of radio amateurs are altruistic, they just want to help. Getting an amateur radio license takes some studying, but Gordon acknowledged that anyone can pass the test. He commented that a nine-year-old had passed this test, so it was not all that hard. But he will be teaching citizens a lot and how to be a volunteer. Beyond the amateur radio examination, volunteer responders also needed additional training so that they understood the community emergency response and the professional response. The whole story can be seen at www.wcjb.com.
And receiving the amateur radio technician licence is not a small privilege. Successful candidates are permitted to run up to 200 watts on four HF bands and up to 1,500 watts on the bands at 50 MHz and above. The Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers Standards Association, the IEEESA Awards and Recognition Committee, has selected ARRL member Richard A. Tell, K5UJU, as the recipient of the IEEESA Lifetime Achievement Award. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more in this report from League Headquarters. Tell has more than 50 years of outstanding contributions to science and technology of non-ionizing radiation safety and has developed standards for the measurement, methods, safety programs, and exposure limits. He's also a member of the ARRLRF Safety Committee, known as RFSC. Tell received a Foundations or a Founders Trophy, rather, in 2022 from the Radio Society of Great Britain, recognizing his outstanding service to that society. RFSC member Greg Lapin and 9 gl praised Tell for his contributions. The entire amateur radio community was fortunate when Rick Tell agreed to join the ARRL RF Safety Committee, said uh, Lapin. Rick's long history with RF safety includes many years with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And during that entire time, Rick donated his time and assumed a leadership role in the development of the uh, IEEE RF safety standards, which make up a large portion of the FCC's regulations related to exposure. Tell received his amateur radio license in 1959 at the age of 15, and he used a homebrew transmitter to work the world. His favorite area of ham radio is analysis and experimentation with antennas. He is also a fellow of the IEEESA and was the 2019 recipient of the Non-Ionizing Radiation Distinguished Service Award from the Health Physics Society. The IEEESA Lifetime Achievement Award will be presented on Sunday, December 4th in Somerset, New Jersey. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Along with other ARRL RFSC members, he helped form an electromagnetic field oversight group, which has been meeting since August 2020 to develop tools and procedures for compliance with the new RF exposure regulations for amateur radio operators in Great Britain. The new rules in the UK are similar to those already in effect in the US and will be phased into the UK over a two-year period. They're currently only in effect for high-frequency bands. He holds a Bachelor of Science from Midwestern State University and a Master of Science from Rutgers University. Prior to entering a private consulting practice related to RF safety matters for the past 33 years, Tell served at the United States Environmental Protection Agency for 20 years, where he led the electromagnetics branch in the Office of Radiation Programs. Tell specializes in analysis and measurements of RF fields, RF exposure standards compliance, and RF safety programs. His background includes participation in a scientific exchange program with Russian scientists on biological effects of electromagnetic energy and numerous publications related to RF safety. He is chair of the IEEESA International Committee on Electromagnetic Safety, TC95 Subcommittee 2, which developed the IEEESA recommended practice on RF safety programs, and he's chair of the IEEESA Committee on Man and Radiation. The South African Radio League reports that three new African countries have joined the ranks of 5 MHz as 60-meter operators. They are Botswana, Lesotho, and Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Each country has access to the new WRC-15 amateur secondary allocation of 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz. This makes a total of 89 countries now on the band worldwide. According to Space.com, the James Webb Space Telescope's first direct image of a planet outside the solar system has been transmitted to scientists, offering promise for deeper research into exoplanets. NASA reports the astronomers received the image of the planet in orbit around a star estimated to be 385 light years from Earth. The image was taken with a near-infrared camera and a mid-infrared instrument in which each focus on different portions of the infrared spectrum there have been only a few dozen direct imaging exoplanets such as this one, 
Astronomers have identified over 5,000 exoplanets, but only by indirect methods of observing starlight dimming as planets pass in front of the star that they are observing. NASA expressed hope that these new infrared images will be a gateway to deeper study of exoplanets. You don't have to live in the state of Connecticut to be a member of the Connecticut CW Club, but it helps if you enjoy sending and receiving Morse code. Members are going to get the chance in a big way this month. The club is having its inaugural CW contest starting on September 17th at 1200 UTC and ending September 18th at the same time. To participate and qualify for a certificate, you need to join the club and membership is free. Members have already signed up from North Carolina, California, Arkansas, New Hampshire, and even Connecticut. Operators who have the three highest scores and the operator who makes the longest distance contact will receive certificates. According to its website, the club has other goals too. Sharing portable operations, including summits on the air and parks on the air, having bi-weekly social meetups, and teaching newcomers the ins and outs of CW. The group's meetings are held in person and on Zoom, so members who don't live locally can still attend. See the website ctcw.club for further information. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. The only thing that worries me more than climbing to 400 feet on a July night with thunderstorms visible in the distance is climbing to 200 feet and then making a turn to the right and moving away from the tower six feet on a sidearm. Just the thought of making a sharp turn on a highway with no exits just doesn't seem natural. But for a climber, it's a necessary part of the job. For the safety-oriented climber, we work to minimize the risk of death. Let's be honest here. If something goes very wrong on a sidearm, one of three things will happen. Death, poopy diapers, or serious injury. Let's examine some potential truths about sidearms. For openers, if the sidearm was about to fall off the tower, it would be visibly obvious just by looking at its mounting hardware most of the time. Also, if that structure survived the past year's worth of ice storms, 90 mile an hour winds, or worse without breaking, chances are it'll support my fat butt for a short amount of time just fine too. Since tower climbers usually own lots of straps, belts, and ropes, we have the ability to choose how we want to protect ourselves when working on sidearms. Basically, we can choose to secure ourselves to the tower or if we want to secure ourselves to the sidearm at all. Depending upon the width of the tower, the design of the sidearm will vary. On a 1-2 to two foot sidearm, many times I stay below it and stay strapped to the tower. I use two or three devices and lean out away from the tower so I'm just below the antenna I'm working on. If the antenna is too heavy to handle this way, I can secure from above or work on it from above. If the sidearm is a big six foot mother, I prefer to climb out onto it to get my work done. What I do is use a very light but very strong rescue strap. It's about 10 feet long and strong enough to pull a car out of a ditch, yet light enough to carry in a big pocket. I attach it with two beaners about five feet above the sidearm on that side of the tower. The other end of the strap goes to my belt. I slide out onto the sidearm and often never strap onto it. Depending upon the width of the sidearm and the weight of the antenna I'm working on, I may never strap onto the sidearm at all. This way, if the sidearm breaks off the tower, I'll drop to the end of the strap and stop while the sidearm can fall away. If I was strapped to the sidearm too, my strap would have to catch all of that weight, which sounds like a bad idea to me. Again, each installation is different. One needs to know the age of the structure and look how well maintained it is and decide how to deal with safety based on a first-hand inspection of the sidearm. There is not much in nature that would put an equivalent weight load at the end of a sidearm equal to my 160 pound body weight. So a climber needs to be very aware of the risks and safety specs of his gear, not to mention the condition of the tower. The professional climber recognizes the danger and works to minimize the risk without losing lots of time and with minimal added weight. If you want to imagine a job I don't ever want is the guy that slides down the guy wires with the bucket of grease smearing a coating from end to end. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. 
This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. MSAT EA is giving its support to small amateur radio satellite designed by students in Romania, a project considered to be the first of its kind for Romanian students. Known as the ROM2 mission, the satellite, built with support of the Romanian organization ROMSpace, is to be assembled in Madrid at the AMSAT EA facility. AMSAT EA, which has registered the satellite internationally, will be responsible for the satellite once it has entered orbit. The satellite's maintenance data will be transmitted via CW. The satellite will fulfill its mission to take photographs with two megapixel camera and transmit them to HAMS, as well as it will be able to retransmit them from their own stations using the SSDV protocol. They'll use a frequency of 436.235 MHz. SSDV packets will be transmitted from the satellite using GFSK. The students attend the International Computing High School in Bucharest and are between the ages of 15 and 18. The Tasmanian Amateur Radio Conference and Ham Expo will be held in Hobart at the University of Tasmania, Sandy Bay Campus, in a spacious and contemporary venue called the Sir Stanley Burberry Lecture Theatre. There will be plenty of free parking and only a short 20-minute trip from the airport. Flights into Hobart run from all major Australian capital cities and direct from Auckland, New Zealand. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Saturday the 5th of November 2022 is the Amateur Radio Conference, featuring a full day of speakers from across Australia and the world, with presentations including youth engagement and amateur radio, remote stations, electrical and RF safety, low-power portable Earth Moon Earth, low-power summits on the air, parks on the air and worldwide flora fauna activations, interference mitigation, digital amateur TV, microwave experimentation and much more. These presentations will be delivered both in person and online. Sunday the 6th of November 2022 is the huge Ham Expo with amateur radio vendors and traders including ICOM, All About DX and many more making their way to Hobart. There will be many pre-loved equipment tables, fox hunts on the day, raffles to win transceivers and handhelds, and information stands, including Alara, that's the Australian Ladies Amateur Radio Association, and Raw, the Rotarians of Amateur Radio. Registrations for attendance, vendors, and pre-loved tables are now open, and registration for the event is essential. For more information and the registration links, please visit reast.asn.au and head for the News Events section. If you can make it there, the organising committee look forward to seeing you all in Hobart. In India, where the birthday of the nation's second president is celebrated as Teacher's Day, Amateur radio educators marked the occasion with a half-day training session for young licensed candidates. In the spirit of the national holiday that honors mentors and educators, 35 students at Sodapur High School in Kolkata, India, attended a practical class on electronics and amateur radio in preparation for testing for their licenses. The course was offered by the Indian Academy of Communication and Disaster Management, an organization founded at the school in 2010 with the help of the West Bengal Radio Club. Nearly four hours of classes were conducted in the spirit of Teacher's Day, a holiday marking September 5, 1888, the birthday of Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, a scholar, professor, and philosopher who was elected President of India in 1962. The classes were taught by Pasupati Mandal, VU2ODQ, Deepak Chakraborty, VU2OKT, and Rinku Nagbizwas, VU2JFB, the secretary of the Indian Amateur Organization. The students are expected to sit for their license tests soon. The Assistant Director for Education and Public Outreach at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has been honored for her work by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Suzanne Gurton is being recognized with the Klumpke Roberts Award for nearly four decades of her effort helping educators develop and present astronomy programs to further the public's understanding. 
Before joining the observatory in 2016, Suzanne Gurton worked at a number of planetariums around the United States and also served as an astronomy lecturer at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. She is a former writer and producer at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Previous recipients of this award have included Isaac Asimov, Carl Sagan, Timothy Ferris, and Walter Sullivan. The observatory is a facility of the National Science Foundation. And finally this week, a crossband activation of NEPM, the battleship USS Iowa's original active call sign, is scheduled in memory of Pearl Harbor. As the representative of the National Museum of the Surface Navy at the Battleship Iowa Museum in San Pedro, California, the Battleship Iowa Amateur Radio Association will honor the sailors and ships previously homeported in San Pedro who were attacked on December 7, 1941, with special crossband activations of NEPM on December 6 and 7, 2022. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, seven of the battleships formerly homeported in San Pedro Bay were not present. Eight Pacific Fleet battleships, the USS Arizona, USS California, USS Maryland, USS Nevada, USS Oklahoma, USS Tennessee, USS West Virginia, and USS Pennsylvania were all at Pearl Harbor and absorbed the brunt of the Japanese attack. Of these eight ships, three sank, one capsized, and four suffered varying degrees of damage. Under the authority of the Navy and Marine Corps Spectrum Office Southwest, they will transmit using the Iowa's NEPM call sign on assigned military frequencies and listen for calls from the amateur radio community in their adjacent bands. NEPM will transmit on 14.375 MHz, 18.170 MHz, and or 21.460 MHz on J3E, upper sideband, and or A1A, CW. The operator will advise listeners as to where they are listening. Amateur participants are reminded not to transmit on the NEPM military frequencies. Operations on both days are expected to be from 1500 to 2400 UTC. QSL procedures can be found at https colon forward slash forward slash B-I-A-R-A dot org. Again, https colon forward slash forward slash B-I-A-R-A dot org. For specific questions in advance of the operation, contact W6HB at BIARA.org. Again, W6HB at BIARA.org. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on-air and podcast, Please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Electron Benders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs This Week in Amateur Radio, every week on Club Own KOKTLP 90.9. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, 
the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, 